Just as Nigerians are still grappling with the harsh reality of economic uh, crisis caused by the outbreak of COVID-19, the federal government announced an increment in electricity tariff, which took effect from the 1st September 2020. According to the Nigerian Electricity Regulatory Commission, only customers who consume regular power supply for 12 hours will pay between 80 to 100 uh, percent increase, while those consuming less than 12 hours will not be affected by the hike. In the same vein, the federal government again increased the pump price of premium Moto Spirit, uh, popularly called petrol, to 151 Naira 56 Cobo per litre. Up from 148 Naira, that's ex depot price, the third increase in three months due to the deregulation of the downstream sector of the, uh, and of course, outright removal of subsidy. With the current increase in electricity tariff and fuel price, the cost of living will further impoverish and increase the difficulties Nigerians are passing through. This is coming at a time where many are trying to recover from the shocks of COVID-19 lockdowns. Now, meanwhile, stakeholders from different sectors have reacted to the recent development, expressing uh, mixed feelings at the hike, uh, while the Trade Union Congress and the Nigerian Labour Congress has handed down an ultimatum to the federal government to reverse the decision or face a total shutdown of the economy. Now joining me uh, live via Zoom to shed more light on this topic of discuss on today's uh, program. He's a former president of the Nigerian Bar Association, uh, Solisa Agbakoba. Thank you very much. He's joining us from our Papa here in Lagos. Thank you for your time, sir. Thank you. Now, I want to start with this way. President Buhari has defended the hike in the price of premium motor spirit as well as electricity tariff. Uh, many say economies globally have been trying to make amends because of COVID-19 and other effects uh, happening globally. Now, what do you make of all of these moves by the Nigerian government? Uh, they're saying that's the way to go. A little bit of pains, but there might be gains later. Yeah, thanks very much. Uh, there's a context to everything. Clearly, the increase in tariffs, both on the electrical side and petrol, is now welcome news for Nigerians, given what they've been going through with COVID and the looming recession in quarter three. But I think at the end of the day, if we really want to rebuild the economic foundation of Nigeria, we've got to see this as what economists will call a technical correction. Once you have an asymmetry in the system, an asymmetry means that some guys are on one side and they can see the opportunities that other guys cannot. So if you take the fuel subsidy issue, very few guys saw the billions in it. We didn't see it. So when you flatten the curve, then the asymmetry is removed. And that means that people are able to eventually get the benefit because the money that the government gets from removal of the subsidy ostensibly goes to feed the budget of the federal government. But there are challenges. First, I think the government failed to explain very clearly what it intended to do. So there is a communication gap in what the government has done. More important, I think, is the lack of trust. There's a trust deficit. People just don't trust the government. So they say, yes, here we go again, yet another hike. How do we know that the resulting savings will be plowed back to social services? That's the problem. So there's no question that it's a difficult decision for Nigerians faced with the crisis of COVID, crisis of poverty, rising unemployment, challenges across the field. But if you look at it from the point of view of restructuring the economy, removing asymmetries, this is a technical correction. And it's something that we have to suffer the pain now for a future gain. Whether that gain will come in future is subject of conjecture. It's that uh, there is no provision for subsidy actually in the 2020 budget. Uh, some are saying that... Um, for the discourse back to electricity now, they say maybe this will make them offer better services. They will be able to invest more in their business because they said that this uh, privatization will yet to reap anything from it in any form. I don't know if you agree to the school of thought. 
Again, it's the issue of Nigerians have been used to paying cheap prices for post services. I mean, I was just asking somebody in Ikoi who spends about 25,000 naira a day running a 100 kVA generator. And he told me, you know, with this increase in tariffs, he's going to pay 8,000 naira a day, provided, and that's the big but, that the discos give us 24 7 light. I would like to pay 10,000 naira a day and shut my generators, provided that I'm sure that the discos will deliver. So again, we go back to the issue of communication and trust deficit. That, I think, needs to be very well explained. So conceptually, the adjustments are economically sound, they make sense. But as to what the common man on the streets will feel is a different kettle of fish. The government needs to do more explaining that this withdrawal of subsidy and hiking prices of electricity will ultimately make the discos more efficient and will make the deregulated price of petroleum more efficient. But I would have also thought that the government would be doing a lot to fix the refineries. So if the government has finally decided to choose deregulation, then I'd like to see our all four refineries deregulated and sold so that we can introduce efficiencies into the petroleum sector. So on the whole, it's a difficult question. There are no easy answers. But I'm prepared to say if the government is going to do what it says by getting more money to plow into social services, then for me that makes sense. I also want to come from this angle of our uh, level of debt. Uh, we saw it recently that um, we are, uh, we're doing more than 30 trillion naira. That's like three times our budget for a year. That's at the rate of 10 trillion naira uh, every year. Now, if government continues along this line, back to uh, our discussion, uh, what do you think will likely happen to the already fragile economy? No, we have no problem with borrowing at all. It's managing the, there's something called public sector borrowing requirements. Nigeria is doing about 8%, so we're well below the international thresholds. Again, the big question is what do we do with the money we borrow? Borrowing that is well managed isn't a problem. And I can also tell you that with 200 million mouths to feed in Nigeria, a 10 trillion naira budget is far too small. We are looking to the pushing our budgets, national budgets, to 60 to 80 trillion naira a year if we hope to achieve double-digit GDP. Our GDP, as you know, by Q3 uh, would go down, I don't know, 14, 15%. I'm not sure what it's going to do. So we're not doing well. And what you do when you have a deflated economy and all the economic parameters are down is to massively borrow. That was what John Keynes, the great... Uh, expansionary economists said fiscal policy now should be very heavy the system should be awash with cash and the cash drives economic restoration so i don't think government has a problem with borrowing where they have a problem is a debt to revenue if you look at the revenue profile so if we have 100 naira government is paying 70 naira so they need to really readjust that but as to whether they have the capacity to borrow, manage it well, and pay, that's not a problem. The other pot potential problem is the population to GDP. Population is outgoing GDP, and therefore in 10 years, we would have a shrinking economy unless we expand our GDP. So it's a sort of, you know, uh, patch 22. W what comes first, the chicken or the egg? So when people say Nigeria is borrowing, well, totally, the UK is going to 100% of GDP in debts. Same with the United States. Well, the, the difference is the resources borrowed are usefully you know, deployed. The resources borrowed here, or the domestic capacity to even generate income, is badly manipulated. Look at uh, the East-West Road, for instance, that will cost 100 billion. The Federal Secretariat in Nikoi has been lying dormant for 30 years, and the value is about 120 billion. So why is it empty? So the government needs to articulate a better you know, public sector borrowing requirement match what it needs to borrow with its investments in roads, bridges, electricity, fuel, and the rest. 
and therefore we'll get a more balanced economy. Clearly, a lot of work needs to be done. We, we've seen committees before now. We saw the Economic Recovery and Growth Plan, beautiful document. Uh, now the federal yeah. government recently inaugurated a new committee now for Vision 2050, yeah. uh, planning to lift 100 million Nigerians out of poverty. Uh, what are yeah. we really lurking? Workable documents or working documents or committees formulation or just what are we really lacking in this country? <laughs> we're, la we're lacking the energy to put our mouth where, um, or is it our money or where our mouth is? Like, well, I'm not sure which it is again. We need to get the economic policy right. Look, economic policy is made up of three components. The macroeconomic component, which has fiscal and monetary. So on the fiscal side, I just talked about John Keynes and the need to expand money into the system. On the money side, on the monetary policy side, we have lending, exchange, and interest rates. We need to see interest rates and uh, lending at single digits. You can't sustain an economy that does 30%. Nobody's going, nobody's going to borrow from the banks. Then you go to the hard economy. That's the roads, bridges, power, etc. Then you have the soft economy, things like the maritime sector, the financial services sector, etc. Trade policy. All three of these elements come together to, to, to form a vibrant economic, you know, uh, platform. There's, there are some missing links. So the economic sustainability plan, which is the current one that succeeded the ERGP, needs to be holistically integrated so that the energies that we've been describing from all sectors. And the other point is the need to bring in the private sector in a more integrated way. When I read the economic sustainability plan, I felt that the government was doing far too much. The government was in business, whilst it is not government's business to be in business. All those things are buying 5,000 solar plants, uh, uh, 300,000 so, uh, houses, social, social housing. Those are things the private sector could easily do. What government needs to do is to set up the relevant institutional, legal, and regulatory environment, ease of doing business, to release the energy for the private sector to kick in. So I think there's, to answer your question, why do we have all these committees and nothing seems to be happening, is to integrate the private sector more into the planning. And I hope to have seen a stronger, uh, um, the Presidential Economic Advisory Committee playing a stronger role in this process. So I think we have all the ingredients. What's, what's missing, and you know, the president himself said it, and it was very interesting that the president said this at the ministerial retreat calls for harmonization and synergy amongst the ministers. And if you recall, he created in the office of the Secretary of the Federal Government a sort of clearing house where all the agendas of the various ministries that have an impact on the economy could be harmonized. I think if we see that, we might begin to see you know, um, a more efficient economy. But I'm going to also give some sort of um, kudos to the president. There are some tough decisions that he has taken that no other president took. And Nigerians ought to really realize that a sound economy is like a baby. To have Nigeria turn around and become sound and enter the first 20 in the world will take at least 10 years. So the government needs to communicate this. The government needs to communicate that we have to be patient. Mm. We have to bear the pain today and we'll gain tomorrow. That, I think, is the economic philosophy that the government should be eschewing. A lot of work needs to be done with regards to uh, letting people understand yeah. what the government really plans to do. Yeah. We've talked about the fundamentals, yeah. inflation, GDP, crude oil prices, interest. Now, I'm, all look, I'm looking at, the, 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 you touched on it, synergy. From the monetary side now and the fiscal side, a lot of work has been mm. done by the central bank. We keep seeing yeah. uh, a lot of support, MSMEs trying to help the agricultural sector. Mm. Oh, are we seeing the same thing coming from the fiscal side in your assessment? It's a bit slow. The, the fiscal side, with a budget of 10 trillion, as I said, can't do anything. The True. fiscal expansionary policy needs to be very aggressive. I mean, in fairness, the Minister of Finance has this, you know, strategic revenue growth initiative around three, you know, products, the NMPC, the FIRS and customs. 
uh, how to generate more money. Suppose these three agencies are making five trillion, then the idea is to make 15 trillion. But I think that needs to be energized. And I think that there are other um, revenue catchment areas that we can look at. We can look at the maritime sector. In fact, the economic sustainability plan doesn't mention the maritime sector at all. Hmm. And I know that this is a huge sector that can contribute outside of oil and gas is the second largest you know, um, revenue generator for Nigeria. So we need to really focus on how we can look inwards to generate you know, revenues. It's not as difficult as it is. And I think when the private sector becomes energized, you will begin to see them respond in different ways. I represent a number of uh, extremely wealthy Igbo billionaires in um, the Odisha uh, Navy trade axis. These are guys that are, that are doing, you know, terrific work, but it's not known. And when the current governor of Anara came on board, he thought that he could, you know, have a synergy with them. Unfortunately, that process collapsed. But there were a group of, you know, businessmen along that sector that were prepared to put 20 trillion naira, 20 trillion naira on the table, cash. So that shows you the sort of wealth we have in this country. But it is for the government to know, to, to, to understand how to resource it. The tools to resource is missing. If it is properly resourced, there are so many dangotes that are prepared to put money into buying a Jakuta, buying a larger steel, buying all the refineries, buying the eight um, fuel silos. As, as I sit in Papa, we, there's a con conundrum. We are locked down by trucks and all sorts of things. And that is revenue being lost. A recent report done by a Dutch maritime consulting company says that as a result of a Papa conundrum, the government is losing 20 billion dollars naira a day times 365. That is 7.3 trillion a year. Can you imagine what that would do if it came into a federal purse? So a lot has to be done to synergize and create wealth locally. If we do so, why don't we looking for foreign, foreign, foreign uh, loans? So our uh, effort to generate money locally really needs to be robust and transformative. All right. I, I think that's a very good way to, to leave it. Human rights activist, maritime lawyer, and former president, Nigerian Bar Association. It's really a pleasure talking to you. Thank you for joining us on Business Nigeria this afternoon. Thank you very much.